OK, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this Meet the Expert talk all about occupational therapy. My name is Emma Grover. I'm the Quality Assurance Practice Lead for Occupational Therapy here at Bucks. Tom, would you like to say hello? Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm Tom Judge. I'm the current Community Occupational Therapy Manager at Buckinghamshire Council. Brilliant, thank you. So uh, hopefully, Tom and I hope that by the end of the session today, you'll feel a lot more familiar with what occupational therapy is um, and what occupational therapists do. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can become an occupational therapist if you decide that OT could be the career for you. But if you're watching this today as a qualified OT or as a student OT, then it's worth sticking around to hear more about what it's like to work as an OT in adult social care here at Bucks. Um, we have some available vacancies, which we'll talk about later. And Tom and I are going to share more about our own careers so far. Now, um, some of the slides we're using today in the talk, they were written by the Royal College of Occupational Therapists as part of the Choose OT campaign. So if this talk sparks interest or you're feeling inspired or you want to know more, I'd recommend that you go onto the chooseot.co.uk website because there's lots of information on there um, which you can revisit after the talk if you want to. So over to myself. So um, what does occupation mean? So occupation doesn't just refer to the jobs people do. It also refers to the everyday activities that we do to look after ourselves and that give a sense of purpose to our lives. It could refer to anything from getting out of bed in the morning through to getting together with your friends. As an occupational therapist, we support people who find some areas of life difficult, and that means talking to them to understand their needs and to see the challenges through their eyes, thus helping us find ways to overcome these challenges. It makes this an incredibly rewarding profession, and it doesn't get much better than knowing you've helped someone to live their life to its fullest potential. When we take a moment to think about the daily activities that matter most to us, how would it make us feel in an accident? Injury or illness became a reason we were not able to do the things we once enjoyed and were important. This is where occupational therapy really makes a difference. And I'd like you to all just think about what if you weren't able to use your mobile phone? Um, you know, and that 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 epitomizes to me, you know, something we're on all of the time, the vast majority of society these days. And if you suddenly lost the ability to use that, occupational therapy is there to there to help you and to reintegrate those things back into your life. Next slide, please. So this is going to be a little bit about a general overview, really, of what occupational therapists do. Occupational therapy is a career that's really centered on people. Um, it requires some problem solving and some creativity, which is always good. But as occupational therapists, we try to look at the world through the eyes of other people. We focus on what they can do, what somebody wants to achieve, as well as the areas of life that they find difficult or challenging. And then we work with that person to find ways to overcome these challenges. Occupational therapy is a vast profession. If you become if you become an OT, you could end up working um, with all different types of people of all abilities. So that could be somebody recovering from an illness or accident that wants to get back on their feet. You could be working with children to develop the skills and confidence they need to get on in life. Or you could be working with older people and empowering those people to become more independent. Our job and our profession encompasses us to know about things like anatomy, physiology, psychology, sociology, this is a long, long list, I'll warn you, medicine, learning disability and mental health. Um, but essentially, we look at all of those different health conditions. We look at the environments that we that we live within. That could be home, that could be school, that could be work. We look at the activities that people want and need to do every day as well as life events that can all impact upon a person's sense of self, their well-being, um, their relationships and their working careers. And then, as I've mentioned before, uh, the focus is that we work together with an individual person to set goals and find a way forward. So as an occupational therapist, you can and you will have a profound and positive impact on the lives of the people of all ages that you will come into contact with. 
I mentioned the mobile phone example, and that is a very, very small example that is hugely, hugely impactful to the benefit that that would have to someone's lived experiences and their overall life and health and well-being. You could be supporting children and younger people, people with physical disabilities, people with mental health diagnoses, people with learning disabilities and older people, as Emma has um, just mentioned. Occupational therapists work in a range of interesting and rewarding environments, including hospitals, out in the community and in places where people work. Other example, examples also include GP surgeries, care homes, prisons, schools, universities, employment and charities. Next slide, please. So I am going to share a bit now about my story so far. Um, what's my job and where do I work? I've mentioned already that I'm the Quality Assurance Practice Lead for OT. That's in the Quality Standards and Performance Service. And in my daily job, I work closely alongside Tom and the, the whole of the occupational therapy team. My role is about improving the quality and effectiveness of OT practice. And a big part of my role is to champion and role model a culture of learning, development, reflection and practice improvement. When it comes to um, why I chose OT, my early career interests had been had been they were, they were healthcare related, but I'd say I'd been thinking more about studying medicine or pharmacy, um, and I didn't know much about OT at all. It was actually my biology teacher who pointed the course out to me, and when I read more about it, I was really drawn to how varied the role could be. I loved that. It was very clear from all of the information I read that the person was at the centre of the practice, uh, which I really, really liked because I, I, I always think about how I would feel if I was receiving um, like any health and social care service. So I, thought, I, I really liked that from the outset anyway. And then I really liked that the course was vocational, meaning that I would be studying a subject that I'd then be able to practice in my daily work once I was qualified. Why do I love my career? I absolutely love being an OT because, again, Tom's already touched on this, but it's all about the profound difference that we can make to, to somebody's life. And when we do sit back and we think about what if, what if something happened to me, what if there was an accident or an illness that meant I couldn't do the things that make my life meaningful, the things that are really, really important to me, um, Tom gave the example of the mobile phone, but if you think about each of us, all of us, if we were in an interactive session right now and we were asking you to, um, I don't know, list the top five most important things that you do in your life, it would be different for all of us. And even if the activities were the same, we would rate them in a different order. Um, but for me, if I wasn't able to take my children to school, then that would have a really significant impact on my well-being, um, my mood, my motivation and all of those other things. So they're just some examples to get you all thinking about occupation and how important occupation is. And then how as occupational therapists, we can use those activities um, as the therapy to sort of get people back to where they want to be and doing what they want to do. I'd say Again, when I talk about why I love my career, there's a saying and it's um, it's that medicine's really important because it adds days to life. But occupational therapy can add life to the days that we have. And I think that really sums it up for me. It feels amazing to be part of a profession which can have such a life changing impact um, to so many people. So I'm going to talk a bit now just about my experience. I studied a full-time three-year um, Bachelor of Science degree at Oxford Brookes University and during each year of study you have practice placements um, and that's to make sure that you get a certain sort of amount of hands-on work experience. It's called practice-based learning. It's where we get to apply um, the theory of occupational therapy practice to real life situations and work settings. So my placements are listed there on the slide. Um, and a lot of mine were community based, understanding how people move around their homes and, and local communities, which I do find really interesting. And it sort of paved the direction I've taken in my in my longer career as well. But after graduating, I worked in a reablement and intermediate care team. I was employed first as an occupational therapy assistant pending my registration. 
um, because you go through a registration process to be able to practice as an occupational therapist after you qualify. And then I moved across to Bucks. I've been at Bucks now for over 10 years and I feel really fortunate because since being here, there's been lots of opportunity for development and growth. And over time, it means I've been able to gradually progress, apply for roles internally um, and move through the different roles from a newly qualified position. I spent a large portion of my career in an advanced practitioner post. Um, and then more recently, in the last couple of years, I've moved into the quality assurance practice lead role. So now I'm going to hand you back over to Tom because he's going to tell you a bit about his story. Thanks, Emma. That was really, really interesting. And um, I'm going to take you guys on a similar journey and um, talk to you about the similar things that Emma has from, from my side of things. So I'm going to cover what my current job is, where I currently work, why I absolutely love being an occupational therapist and why did I choose to become an occupational therapist initially in the first place? So next slide, please. So why did I choose to become an occupational therapist? So initially I was considering being a physiotherapist. I think as we're growing up as kids, we know about doctors, we know about nurses. Most of us generally might know about a physiotherapist from playing sport. Um, so naturally I was sort of gravitating towards um, physiotherapy. I was playing rugby. Um, so it was something that was just naturally part of my life at that time or a profession that I could relate to and link in some of my key interests around biology and science. Um, however, I actually sustained quite a severe uh, knee injury and was forced, you know, as part of my uh, injury to ask myself, you know, what if my mum wasn't a nurse with all of her experience and her knowledge and ability to support me? You know, how would someone without this luxury learn to compensate for an injury or a disability, rehabilitate themselves, get through the rehabilitative process and then continue to live independently? So it really forced me to take stock on life, but actually via a lived experience, I was actually awakened to some of the challenges that people face and actually you know it, ma it made me explore and look at what can fill those uh, fill that void in people's lives um, as a result of just general discussion in that time frame I, I sort of learned that my actual aunt was an occupational therapist in paediatrics and spent some time with her in a school which was for blind children over in Kent. So I spent a week there seeing what occupational therapists did in the world of um, paediatrics and particularly with uh, children with uh, blindness but other profound um, disabilities and, and learning disabilities. Um, from there on really the, re the rest is history um, but ultimately I've sort of put this picture up on the slide because for me it, it's absolutely about um, you know helping people to live their lives to the fullest and and to simply not just be an existing person on this planet um, and the interventions that you know I've been able to provide or my team have been able to provide or you know colleagues and peers that I've seen you know the the impact is massive and it's super super rewarding um, and I think there are there are very few jobs that offer the same level of of reward um, you know, you have an, almost an instant gratification when you see you've you've even suggested something and it's very, very small, but it has a massive, massive impact on how that person can live their life. Um, next slide, please. So what do I do in my current role? So my, my current role is a, a leadership and management position. Um, I currently lead the team of occupational therapists and they're all absolutely awesome. Uh, and that's for Buckinghamshire Council. We work across the county of Buckinghamshire and we visit people predominantly in their own homes, uh, taking a strength based approach in supporting them to live independently. And that can be through the provision of very small, simple aids, such as the one you can see on the slide, uh, which is to help somebody use a pen, um, right the way up to things such as major home adaptations, such as level access showers, wet rooms and um, extensions to, to support people such as wheelchair users. Um, etc. Next slide please. So what does my career look like to date? So it's a bit of a blur, blurry picture, lots of pictures on the slide. Uh, I'll do my best to talk you through what has been you know, near, near on 15 years in health and social care. Um, the yellow dots are roles that I did prior to being a qualified occupational therapist. The light green are qualified roles. 
Um, the orange dot is some private work that I've done and the two darker green dots towards the tail end are as I've progressed through my career moving into a more taking a, um, a pathway down a more leadership and management route. So initially I started off working as a healthcare assistant in ITU at Northwick Park. It was it was convenient. It's where mum used to be the nurse. Um, so whilst I was studying, it was a good way to earn money. I saw an amazing amount of things. I learned a hell of a lot about anatomy, physiology, biology. I'd see um, open bowel surgery. I've seen, you know, open cardiac um, massage. Um, I used to attend all of the um, cardiac arrest within the hospital with the intensivists and support with intubation and CPR. Um, so I learned uh, in a really protective way a lot about medicine, um, you know, and, and the inner runnings of an intensive care unit. Um, obviously, whilst I was working here, I studied um, at Coventry University, had a fantastic student life there, lived on, on campus for three years. Um, whilst I was there, I had three different practice placements, which was a community hospital, a medium secure mental health unit, which I then went on to work as an activity coordinator throughout some of the university holidays. Uh, and then I finished off in my third year, just prior to qualifying as an occupational therapist within the acute and general medicine team at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where I was then fortunate enough to um, be appointed onto the band five rotational scheme, which was which was fantastic a real breadth of exposure to lots of different um, ward environments and clinical settings covering accident and emergency, um, frailty, trauma and orthopaedics, respiratory, um, oncology, haematology, burns and plastics. So in, for example, in burns and plastics, we would be seeing people who had obviously burns and providing splints um, and pressure garments, all of which we fabricated ourselves. We've probably all got friends who we've seen who've fallen over and broke their hands or their wrists or their fingers through sport um, and have got a fancy coloured um, thermoplastic splint. So we would be involved in prov providing those and fabricating them in an outpatient setting. And then I sort of moved into uh, the world of stroke and neurological conditions, which I then moved on to a uh, band six rotational program, which covered more around uh, neuro. So I worked at Buckinghamshire Neuro Rehab Unit, where I was working with uh, wheelchair users, people with MND, multiple sclerosis, um, young people who had suffered, you know, quite severe strokes and needed quite a lot of intensive rehabilitation to recover and to try and live as fulfilling and an independent life as possible. Um, and then from uh, here, I moved into working in central London at the Royal Brompton, uh, which is a cardiothoracic centre, um, one, of, one of the top in the, in the UK, if not the world, um, where I worked in adult critical care, cardiothoracic surgery, uh, and worked with people with um, long term respiratory uh, and complex respiratory conditions such as cystic fibrosis, people requiring ventilation to 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 live. Um, and I was also involved in outpatient pulmonary rehab classes. Uh, and then whilst being at the Brompton, I was promoted internally to work uh, um, in cardiothoracic surgery and critical care. So it's a really nice link back to my roots, starting off as a healthcare assistant, unqualified uh, at Norfolk Park, to then becoming a um, advanced clinical practitioner. And at the time there was very few in the country um, in terms of OTs covering uh, intensive care units. As a result, I became uh, the critical care forum lead for the Royal College of OT and uh, that role has been fairly busy over the last couple of years with the likes of COVID uh, and supporting uh, a huge, huge influx of occupational therapists into this clinical setting. Um, you know, and supporting people who um, have never worked in this environment uh, to operate under some quite um, challenging situations due to COVID um, in a clinical environment and setting that is quite complex by, by nature of what it does. Um, I've been able to lecture as well at Brunel, Brunel University, so as well as going into sort of leadership and management and advanced clinical practice and, um, you know, the QSP roles. There's also opportunities to branch out through education and educational settings to be an occupational therapy lecturer um, at a variety of different levels. Um, in the last few years, I've done some private work in the esports industry, um, looking at 
uh, health and well-being. Esports is a booming industry. It's it's becoming a, a, a more and more um, professional sport with some quite significant uh, financial figures attached to to wins in this space. Um, yet the uh, players don't necessarily adopt the um, best health and well-being. So I've done some work with Samsung and um, Ready Player One uh, magazine, writing articles on uh, improving health and well-being. Uh, just generally as an individual, generally as a younger population who are, are less active these days and the benefits that that has in terms of uh, enhanced sports performance in this space. Um, prior to joining Buckinghamshire Council, I ran and managed the occupational therapist and the physiotherapist for acute and general medicine at the John Radcliffe Hospital. And then about eight months ago, I joined the fantastic Buckinghamshire Council to lead the uh, community occupational therapy team, um, moving into a world um, where, you know, there was a lot of learning for myself in terms of major adaptations uh, and disabled facilities grants. And it's really, really nice to be able to see people within their own home environment and support them within their own home environments to live as, um, you know, optimal uh, carefree and independent lives as possible uh, in what is a great organisation that is, you know, heavily supportive and, and with some great opportunities. Um, next slide, please. Thanks for sharing that, Tom. Just before I move on to the next slide, I was going to um, say it's probably, I don't know, I don't, I'm going to call it a top tip, but um, who knows if it is. But Tom mentioned uh, in his talk just now about um work experience opportunities during your study and i just thought it was a really good point to pick up on because um both tom and i had the opportunity to work as an ota essentially an ot assistant um during university holidays and during our study as it allowed and i think that's a really good thing to do if you can if that opportunity arises uh, i don't know what you would say back to this tom but i think it's a really good way of getting really extra um extra work experience with added value prior to qualifying so always if you're if you're at the point of potentially choosing this career this as a career or you're you've made the choice to um step into the world of occupational therapy and you're you're going to be studying it um seek out those opportunities and see if they're around i think i think that would be a, a positive thing to do tom i don't know if there's anything you want to add yeah, I would, I would absolutely uh, mirror what you've just said, Emma. It, it was a fantastic opportunity and it's a great way to learn and gain exposure in different clinical settings, be it mental health, physical health, local authority, NHS, wherever you choose to do that. Um, it's just a, a nice supportive way where um, you can, you're afforded a real opportunity to learn in a protective way. Um, and you're likely to be exposed to some things that will massively accelerate your learning throughout your career, um, massively help in terms of your understanding your, and your, the breadth of your knowledge base around health and social care and being an occupational therapist in a health and social care setting. So I, I can advocate for it enough. Um, and obviously, if you do choose to then go on and qualify as an occupational therapist, it really does stand you in good stead in terms of getting a job at the end of um, your qualification. So, you know, uh, again, a really top tip. I'd really advocate that you you explore those options and, um, you know, mirror, mirror what Emma has said in this space. Brilliant, thanks Tom. I'll move on to the next slide. So um, we've talked generally, prior to sharing our stories with you about our own careers, we've talked generally about uh, the occupational therapy role, but we want to talk a little bit more around the OT role here in Adult Social Care at Buckinghamshire Council and how we support the residents of Buckinghamshire. And Tom has spoken already about how sometimes the smallest piece of advice or a low level piece of equipment can make a very big difference to daily life. Um, but to talk a bit more about that, as an occupational therapist, wherever you work and whatever role you do, you'll be working in accordance with the occupational therapy professional standards, as well as the relevant legislation and um, guidance uh, with wherever it is that you're working and the practice area that you're working within. So when we think about adult social care, we uh, we need to be thinking a lot about working in accordance with the Care Act um, 2014. And also here at Buckinghamshire, we work within the Better Life Strategy. 
So um, Tom's mentioned a strength-based approach, but we use a person-centred and strength-based approach to support the residents of Bucks to live independently, regain independence, and also to live uh, with support. And as OTs, we can use some of these methods listed on the slide um, as ways to do that. So to be strength-based, we focus first on what a person is able to do, and we think about then how to build upon that um, and make the most of someone's abilities. We work with people to understand what outcomes it is that they want to achieve, any goals they might have. And then by teaching someone a new way of doing something, giving information and advice, prescribing equipment or suggesting minor or major changes to the home, um, these are all solutions that we can consider and we can use to maximise a person's independence. And daily tasks at home, we've touched on this already, but just to recap, it could be um, getting in and out of bed, getting on and off the toilet, stepping in and out of your front door, going up and down the stairs, getting washed and dressed. I mean, that's a handful of examples, but I think when we really truly think about all of the occupations, all of the things we do every day, we take a lot of those for granted and it's only when we break it down and think about everything we do, say, for example, between waking up and getting out the door to go to work. Um, there are a lot of things within that and if we're not able to do them, it can make it can make a big difference. It can really affect our well-being. So whenever we're looking at solutions um, as OTs, we have a number of approaches that underpin our practice. A couple of these include an educative approach and a compensatory approach. And what that means is that we're looking at ways to educate or compensate for a loss in function or a loss in ability to sort of fill that gap and then ensure that that person is, is doing everything they can um, to the best of their ability. So that's what we're doing in this area of practice. We are looking at often long term condition management um, and really looking at how we can maximise how somebody functions within their own home, how they move around it, how they do what they want and need to do. Um, and, and yeah, the, these are just some examples on here of how we can support people to do that. Tom, I'm going to hand over to you now to talk a little bit more about what it's like to be an OT at Bucks Council. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, so so what is it like to be an occupational therapist here in Buckinghamshire Council? Well, um, first and foremost, uh, and some may say oh, I am biased, but the occupational therapy team here is made up of a group of fantastic individuals. Um, we have a real variety and depth of different clinical, qualified and non-qualified backgrounds here within our team. Everyone within the council is extremely kind, friendly and supportive, and there's a fantastic opportunity for career progression here, as Emma has previously referenced. Um, we hold CPD time, supervisions, appraisals and time to reflect and learn with the utmost importance and members of the team feedback and report that they feel engaged and well supportive here. Nationally, occupational therapy as a profession uh, is growing in its recognition about what we can deliver and how we can really help um, society uh, in terms of live, people living healthier um, for longer with less dependence on care uh, and less um, sort of financial sort of strain and support placed upon the system. However, sadly, there is currently a national shortfall of occupational therapists and particularly within the southwest region. Um, as is often the case, we find that people don't generally know about occupational therapy unless they've had an experience or they know a loved one who is an occupational therapist. So it's really important that we do things like we are today, where we reach out and engage with the, um, younger people, uh, those people in sixth forms or those that necessarily don't know what they want to, to do to highlight the profession. Um, because I feel that if people understand and know about what we can do and what we can deliver uh, and the breadth of where it can be delivered, then people will hopefully look to explore occupational therapy as a profession earlier on rather than necessarily stumbling across it later on in life. Um, as a result of uh, sort of the growing um, uh, acknowledgement of what occupational therapy can deliver, to health and social care in general. Um, there's lots of new posts and lots of new positions increasing across the country. Obviously, sadly, we're, we're, we're balancing that against the national shortfall. 
Um, but Buckinghamshire invested heavily in um, March of last year in inc increasing and expanding its number of occupational therapists and occupational therapy assistants. As a result, we do have some vacancies. So if today has really um, got your attention and you're really keen to uh, either explore occupational therapy as a, as a career and you're looking for some guidance and advice, or you're a qualified member who is looking to, um, you know, want to change uh, roles and, and positions where you currently are, then we would love, love, love to hear from you. And please do reach out to um, to Tara or myself or Emma, um, and we'd be more than happy to, you know, have a chat with you about what opportunities are available in general and particularly what if opportunities are available here in Buckinghamshire. Next slide, please. So the next question that we're going to ask you, and obviously it's not interactive session, but hopefully lots of you will be nodding to this, but could you be an occupational therapist? Are you a problem solver? Are you a people person? And do you get a buzz out of helping people? Because if you are answering yes to any of those, then this really could be um, a fantastic career uh, for you to choose. So bear these things in mind and, and do do more reading if this is and um, if this is really interesting and you are thinking about this as, a, as an opportunity. There are two ways in which you can become an occupational therapist. You can do what's known as a more traditional route, so um, going to university to study a full time degree course. Uh, full time degrees take three years to complete unless you are in Scotland, in which case it's four years. There are also part time courses available. You can also now do a degree level apprenticeship. So if you prefer to work while you study, then a degree level apprenticeship might suit you. Um, so do look into that more if, if you're interested in that and if that sounds good. And just um, just to say there are actually over 35 universities across the country that you could study occupational therapy at. In terms of what thinking about what you should study if you are thinking about going down this road, um, this slide talks about some GCSEs um, which include English language and maths GCSE or equivalent and that science subjects are often a good idea as well. Tom and I have mentioned about the kind of anatomy, physiology side of, of things that you cover in the course and that will um, stand you in good stead for your future career. Uh, if you're thinking about A-levels, there's some just suggestions on here about some topics that you could pick. But what I would say is that grades and qualifications that you'll need to get a place on a course vary. So we definitely recommend that you visit the websites of universities that you're interested in attending. Um, and if you, I mean, there are other options on this slide, such as the diploma in health and social care or access, um, access courses that you can do. Because if you want to go down the apprenticeship route, then there can be more flexibility on the qualifications that um, you may need. So this brings us to the end of, of the talk for today. We hope that Tom and I have managed to give you some insight into why we love being an OT, why we think that being an occupational therapist is an absolutely wonderful career. Um, also, we hopefully have covered an overview on, on why Bucks Council is a great place to be an OT. And as you can see from our stories, they're completely different. Our career journeys are different and it, and it highlights how broad a profession this is and how many directions that a career in OT could take you in. So if you're thinking following today that OT could be a career for you, then who knows where your occupational therapy career could take you. Um, it's, it's fantastic and exciting and we, we hope you found it interesting. Tom and I are going to stay around a bit longer to answer any questions. So Tara, um, on that note, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Emma. So um, we don't have any questions coming through just now, um, but just to let everybody know that's attended, um, I will be sending out an email after um, the event um, with the recording, as well as our contact details for anybody who does want to get in contact with us after the event. If you do have any questions, um, if you don't fancy you know, asking them now, um, you can ask them a bit later and we can potentially get in contact with you, have a call with you directly to discuss the role further. Um, but yeah, as I said, um, I'm just looking. There's no there's no questions coming through just now, but um, I just want to thank you and Tom again for for delivering such a good a good presentation. Um, 
Um, just having a look. So yeah, there's nothing coming through. I think um, if we leave it at, I'll, I'll send an email out to everybody. Um, and if anybody does have any questions following this event, they can get in touch. Brilliant. Thank you all for attending and for listening. Thank you all. Thank you.